listening to Radio Owl's Nest. The songs of Martin Page, all day, all night, forever. So grab a cup of tea, settle down with us in the Owl's Nest. Well, this is a very special, special, special episode. No number on it, it's an original. Uh, my good friend, well, actually, my best friend for millions of years is Mr. Brian Fairweather, my partner as a songwriter all through the late 70s into the 80s. And believe it or not, we are actually making noise together. So we thought, let's do a radio show together again. So here he is, Brian Fairweather. I thought you were talking about somebody else there when you said... <laughs> <laughs> no, you are my best, best friend, friend, aren't you? Oh, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's right, yeah. <laughs> It's a joy to I have you here. Now. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely that they've wheeled him in in a wheelchair. And the nurse has backed off. He's on his own. So now we can ask him. So, <laughs> oh, there, there I am. <laughs> That's a mistake. That was supposed not to be there. <laughs> actually, it came I'm on. I'm here. Yeah, now let me turn that off again. I'm you, actually here you now. Actually, you actually arrived before the door. I have arrived. I have arrived. That is very, very special. Let's turn that off. So, um, a real, real, real buzz uh, to have Brian with me today. And I'm going to ask him lots of questions. We're going to play music in between uh, us rambling together. And we do ramble pretty well, don't we, Brian? We ramble. We don't really write songs. We just ramble and laugh. That's been our whole story of our life. But in between... Um, us rambling, we will be playing you songs that we've been writing together recently. It's been a long time, um, long time coming. I don't want to say how many years, but uh, yeah, one or two. Yeah, don't, <clears throat> don't, don't let. And we won't have any photographs at all of us. It's with just us. as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we do radio shows now we just do not want just to be seen safe <laughs> but we will be stopping and playing you some things and telling you about that also talking about our whole history together but i want to ask brian uh you were born in norway right when i first met you you were from denmark or absolutely wrong <laughs> <laughs> nowhere near norway what a start <laughs> <laughs> born in glasgow scotland ah now are you when i met with you i wasn't sure if you were from liverpool but you really are a scotsman right? well i spent uh 13 years in liverpool but uh born in scotland yep. little baby yep. moved down to london at two years old wow uh spent up to grammar school in liverpool and then moved back to uh, scotland with my parents i didn't move back my now, I always imagine being an Englishman, and all the years we've been together, I, these questions I'm going to ask you, I've I've never asked you, which is pretty amazing, isn't it's it? It's never been relevant. No. <laughs> <laughs> we were actually focused in the early days. We didn't we're care. We were too busy laughing and That's having right. a good time. Well, we didn't care. We just wanted to write songs. But I've got this chance to ask you, um, was Glasgow rough and tough when you were a kid? It was very rough, and it's, it's weird because you, um, when you live in Glasgow in those days, you kind of play up to it because I was like, when I went back to Glasgow, when I was two years old, it didn't, I didn't notice, funnily enough. Well, thank God. But when I went back, when I was 14, 15, yeah. you, you end up playing up and you, you end up being actually tougher than you are because you, uh, you have this yeah. wall up of defense. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah. when I was at school, I had a hard time at school because I spent 13 years in England in uh, Birkenhead. Uh, near Liverpool, mm -hmm. and when I went back to Scotland, I had this weird accent. Uh huh. You know? And the last thing you need when you're 14, 15 years yeah, old, yeah, and you're going yeah. into high school yeah, in yeah. A, a foreign country, is a weird accent, or you don't speak the language or whatever. Yeah. And uh, that's what I had. So that was my. So lot. you got beat up a lot. Um, I don't know. Or you ran really I, fast. I beat up back. Ah. And ah. I, I befriended the toughest guy in the school. Ah, so we wise to, move. We wise used move. to hang out together for uh, for defense purposes. That's pretty cool. Now, what, now in Glasgow, and you're a kid there, and you went to you art college, right? Art Glass college, yeah, Glasgow School of Art. And th is that what you want to do? Um, I always wanted to be a musician, <laughs> right from the beginning. From the very beginning. Well, that's amazing. When my, uh, I remember my brother was three years old. My brother Ian was three years older than I was. And he used to bring back um, Beatles records, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, when I was a little kid. Yeah. And I used to think, that is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, art was just another form of creative expression for me. So, mm -hmm. you know, doing art was just natural. It was you, you're a great drawer. I mean, well, you're a great artist. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, well, 
I, and technical, I may have been. technical drawing as well. I remember that I saw some yeah. of the technical drawings were pretty. I hot. did industrial design yeah, yeah. in uh, art school, mm. and the only reason I did that is because I wanted the most, um, like, technical and academic kind of. Uh, um, qualification behind me just yeah, in yeah. case things didn't work out that's very wise I didn't take any exams and I escaped them all while you went through it all but also <coughs> you if you're not we all went to art college didn't we to get grants and to be rather free back in that time you could yeah. practice in a band while you were at art college I mean Jimmy Page and Townsend we all of all the guitarists seemed to be at art college it was almost as if you go to art college and it's kind of incidental yeah being yep. at art college because yep. it, you know like you and i both we both went to art school but playing in a band was the most important thing so know? when did when did you get your first guitar uh when i was nine oh, that's a no actually before i was nine actually i think i was about seven not one of those uh plastic beetle it guitars. was it was, was it did i, I got tell one of you those? about that or no not? no no but i bought one of those i mean you had these plastic strings on it and it had pictures of the beatles all pink and it was like you know uh but you thought you had a guitar I had a four-string Beatles guitar. With, so did I. With four Beatles pictures <laughs> on it. So did I. And the first song I ever played was Home and the Range. <laughs> in G. <laughs> so did I. No, no, no. no I, <laughs> that's, that's I just, played it in G. I played it in G. You played that's it in right, D. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, that, those guitars, you couldn't tune up, could you? No, uh, well, you could tune it up, but it wouldn't stay in tune. Yeah, yeah. I, I can imagine you tuning up. But I can imagine me getting really frustrated and go, "Why doesn't it stay in tune all the time?" You know, and the, <laughs> if you got the Beatles guitar, it should be perfect, right? You would think so. Yeah. So you kept it though. That's right. I, actually, I wish I, had, I wish but I still had it. I'd have put it on the wall in the studio if I still yeah. had it. That'd be very cool. Now you, so you started real early, um, but you did um, uh, take it serious, right? Because you were in a band before I met you called Oberon, which were very Genesis and prog rock, yes. right? Was that your first band? No, the, uh, the first band I was ever in was a band that was named after a Fleetwood Mac song, and it was not, not the... Albatross? Adventure. Yeah, Albatross. Well, yeah. that was just a wild guess of mine, huh? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, I just guessed that. I thought well, that's Are pretty good. Are you sure good. I never told you that? Well, you might have, but um, I can't remember. But I just thought, what what yeah. kind of uh, Fleetwood Mac title could you use for a band? Oh, well, part dun, one. Dun, 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 yeah. Although, dun, 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 Albatross, dun, dun, you'd think like, oh, dear. It was, nothing, it was nothing like the song. <laughs> we used to play... Um, Slow and cumbersome. What did we play? We played uh, Canned Heat. Yeah. Well, let's, we, let's get together. Uh, what was that song? No, it was... Uh, on the uh, Road Again? On the Road Again. Ma, I'm, I'm hot today. I'm on the road yeah, again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great that, song. And we played that. Someone's going to get the head kicked in tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't Slade do that? <laughs> uh, it sounds like a Slade number, right? Well, anyway. you see, see, you were doing... Really, when you think about it, you were doing quite um, important... Um, clever music early on i mean how, how old were you when you were actually playing those kind of tracks by well, canned heat were you were you, over, you weren't nine then you were in your team no right? i was in my team <laughs> yeah. i was i was uh i was actually a guitarist but yeah. um uh tommy baker was the uh the guitarist in the band and he was excellent he was a, a great blues player so you learned a lot from uh, him and they didn't need a guitarist because he had tommy so uh, i played bass so wow. i was a bass player and i was 14 years old i just got to jump in here and say yeah. this is useful that brian played bass back then because when we were on the in the house of stone and light tour there was a couple of songs that brian played bass on and i was oh, able right, to right, wander right. around the stage and point at people <laughs> and then you knew you had to play bass yeah, yeah. I had an old box base. I don't know if you remember the. the oh, they yeah. Were, they were like plywood. Yeah, remember yeah. Remember that? I remember. Painted yeah. plywood and they had four strings on it. And yeah. they called it a bass guitar and put box on the top of it. And it was like, <laughs> there you go. That'll be <laughs> 60 pounds, please. <laughs> In a porn shop. In a porn shop? A por no, porn. P porn. Okay. A w. Okay. So you then, I mean, Ober mm. you, Oberon was the next band? After that was... Um, what, what I'm getting here, though, is which actually I didn't really know, is that in all these early years, that's really what you were concentrating on yes. all the time. That was your focus. That was my focus. After I think after uh, Albatross, I, I, that's, that was in Liverpool, in Birkenhead. We did a lot of clubs in Birkenhead and uh, beach parties and stuff like that. Uh, I, now, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yes. A beach party in Liverpool. Yes. That's hard to comprehend. It was it's cold. always raining. It was cold. <laughs> It actually, it wasn't raining. It was, beach, a, beach it was a one night of the year that wasn't raining. <laughs> Doesn't did, sound real, Brian. It's Come called on. good scheduling. So um, <laughs> after that, we moved up to Glasgow, and uh, I was looking for a band in Glasgow, and uh, 
I um, first got into, I met um, some old, old friends of mine called Harvey Jarvis and Barbara Aitken at art school, and we, we formed a band called Crusoe, oh. and I was a guitarist in Crusoe, and we did uh, a lot of the, the circuit, the Glasgow circuit in um, in, uh, in Glasgow. Now the Glasgow circuit was pretty lively then. There were some good good bands and good musicians breeding up there, right? There was a lot of, mm. lot of action, especially in the 80s, uh, uh, late yeah. 70s, early 80s. Uh, there were, you know, and, and still is a hotbed for, for yeah. talent, you know. It's, there's a lot of talent in Glasgow. So when did you join? Um, well, I always, when I met you first, Oberon was the band that I remember thinking more about that you were, that was quite focal to your coming up to London. Oberon was... Um, how did it start? There was, there was, I, I saw an advert. I think somebody uh, put an advert out in a local paper, and uh, it was the eventual keyboard player. But at the time, he was the bass player of the band, Paul Wilson. And um, Paul and I got together, and I, the first thing I, I remember thinking when I saw Stephen, his name is Stephen, Paul Wilson, was he he looked like a baby because yeah. I was like you know twenty. Well, no, 20 I, years I, old again for everybody i have to jump in here uh, when i met brian he was like a wild man he had hair that was like <laughs> he looked like he was uh, no, you just stopped there i had hair <laughs> jethro tull <laughs> just think jethro tull um and that's when i met brian he was what you would think would be coming from scotland with the band like thin lizzie or something like that there was definitely a um, hairy thing going on there was a hairy thing going on it was a paul kossoff gig there you go yes. yeah which I loved. I thought, oh, that, yeah. that's the real thing. Well, yeah. obviously, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> it was Paul Kossoff actually trying to look like me, <laughs> not me trying to look like Paul Kossoff. <laughs> so Oberon, though, Oberon did Genesis kind of prog rock, right? And Steely Dan, though. You yes. Were we, we Sophisticated. Start, we started off with a, a, a little band that um, Paul Wilson had had for, you know, it was a little three or foursome. And... Yeah. Uh, we did some personnel changes and got a couple of guys in that I that I knew, and uh, we switched Paul from uh, bass to keyboard player because he was a really good keyboard player, and uh, they had they had tons of keyboards. They uh, they even had had a Mellotron, which we that used was, to. That was that is the actual godlike keyboard oh, that everybody wanted at that time. Unbelievable. Now, for you out there thinking what the Mellotron is, we you know just think about uh, the Beatles and what was the song they used that on uh, Strawberry Fields Forever. Yes. And of course, uh, this was vocals all on tape, so you were, you were able to bring a choir and an atmosphere of um, reverence to your songs, right? Well, the greatest uh, the greatest example of the use of Mellotron as a main keyboard was in 10 CC. Remember? I'm not in love. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I fell in love to that song. Yeah. yeah. That you did what? To another woman? To No, man. <laughs> <laughs> Cut the show. We stop here. Start again. <laughs> of course, another woman. <laughs> so, um, Mellotron. Are you a romantic at heart then? Oh, I am. You I am. I mean, music. So if I was to play now. It's music that touches you, right? Yeah. But I mean, yeah. Uh, well, sounds a bit like Trevor's. <clears throat> Trevor's Trevor small small opening. Opening. Yeah, we're leading somewhere Sorry, here again. Trev. If, so if I played a Mellotron chord now, you would go all soft and gooey. I'd go all soft and gooey. But you wouldn't come toward... You, you uh, no, no, no. no it's still, that's still not the weight of my heart, mate. <laughs> <laughs> You're going the wrong way. So, so we're talking about progressive <laughs> rock here. We're going to get out of this tangent. And you went... <laughs> but Oberon, you thought you may be, that may be the band, right? That might get signed and everything. There was a lot of potential there. Well, we were playing the circuit with uh, Cato Bell. And, oh, uh, Cato Bell. They, they had the reputation of oh, being were. red hot. Yeah, they, they, Session they, we, 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 f we figured we were the hottest bands on the circuit at the time. It was Oberon and Cato Bell. That's big news. And uh, we all used to go to the same parties. We used to go to each other's gigs. And yeah. uh, it was uh, it was a really magical time. Um, and, and when you think about it, from what I knew in, in London following it, the K. Dubow did get signed, didn't they? They did, Yeah. yes. We didn't, on mm -hmm. the other hand. Yeah. We, um, we did the circuits long after they, uh, they got signed. And uh, remember Johnny and the Self-Abusers? Yeah. They yeah. eventually became Simple Minds. Ah. Uh, they were playing uh, ah. round about the same time as we were up in uh, in Glasgow, but we moved Plan on. Mass. All playing the same circuit then, in a way. Same circuit, yeah. yeah. There, there, there were only like you know certain pub gigs you could play in Glasgow. I mean, it wasn't like there was a ton of gigs to play. So know? even then, you might have been thinking uh, as a Scottish band that you needed to, to break out and come into England and London. Yes, yes, and that's what we decided to do. Yeah, two-ton van. Yeah, on the back of it with a mattress. Oh, those were the days. Yes. 
That's Cigarette really smoke, stopping every like 50 hours to let people have some baked beans and toast. We on lived the on the cigarette yeah. smoke. Yeah, yeah. That's that was your oxygen one. That was my main protein. <laughs> Tobacco. <laughs> Do you know what we talk about? We actually we talked about this in the kitchen before we did the radio show here because we are at Radio Owl's Nest and the kitchen is very near to us so that we can have our cups of tea. And we were we were saying that um, in those days you lived for being in a van, stuck in, uh, all crunched up, going to a gig that is sixty miles away, and then turning around, coming back, no sleep, going out again. But nowadays. I looked at Brian and said, mm. I don't think we could probably do that again. I, I can't we? imagine that. It gives me a headache. You load all your it. gear and you load it all out. I know. You do it everything. You, you mix yourself. I remember whole, one day we went, to, we went to Greenock with uh, with Oberon. And Greenock is this little place on the, the, the west coast of Scotland. And uh, we were, were driving up the road and uh, we went around a corner in a transit van. And the uh, the, the side door flew open and the drum kit <laughs> fell out. <laughs> I was like, hmm. <laughs> Couldn't go through that again. No, no, it's it's it's, it's too actually, painful. But th when you think about it, though, um, if we hadn't gone through it, we wouldn't have. You wish you wish to get through it, although it is so. Sp it's very romantic, isn't it? Well, when, when you're it, doing it as a team, when like it was an army, when yeah. it's happening, I wouldn't have had it any other way. Yeah, you know. And I look back on it, I kind of remember the good times more than I remember the bad times. Yeah, yeah. So. And of course, it was so a lot the, of good times. The music papers, Music Express, and Melody Maker. You used to see with the, these bands that may, weren't even signed. You know, like Kay Bell in the early days. But you had a lot of respect for these yes. touring bands that were doing the doing the roots. Didn't you? Absolutely. It was a special yeah. romantic time. I don't. I don't think it's the same now, is it? Um, well, you were back in being England, the age yeah. I am. I'm not yeah. in touch with it, but uh, yeah, I, I I don't know, and I don't see it. I mm. see, you know, like with the the way the music business is these days, um, with downloads as opposed to records, and there's not the same um, uh, interactivity. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, like picking up that record and sticking it on. A well, I suppose table. what we're, we're, we're about to lead into there is technology has changed yeah. so much that so there's yeah. not a need to do it, is there? It's a no, different kind not. of thing. Hey, this is a perfect perfect time to play a brand new song that me and brian are working on and the song is called spook and i'll let brian uh, before we spin it tell you a little bit about it okay well spook was um an idea that martin came up with that uh it was something we neither of us knew what we were going to do with it and it was a, a very basic uh chorus and uh and a, and a groove Yep. And uh, I took it back home, and we uh, we we sort of messed with it. We majorly. really tore it apart. We just messed it. with yeah, it, and yeah. I kept coming back to Martin. He would say, "Like that, don't like that." And eventually, we we built it into roughly what you're going to hear right now. It's got a mystique to it. It's got a a depth to it that um, it's got it's, a bit of what Q feel was a bit the early days as well. As well. Yeah. So, here everybody is a little thing that Brian and I, what's a thrill to write together again? This is called Spook.
across the dance Light up on the run So there you are, Spook. What a weird little piece of music that is. But listen to those horns. I mean, that's all Brian. I mean, it's one chord in this song, and Brian actually went back to his place and developed it into all those exciting parts. I have to say, bro, I didn't know you were a horn arranger. Am now. <laughs> Moving on. Now, we've got Mr. Fairweather coming now from Scotland into London. It wasn't the whole band that came up. It was just you and two players, right? No, there was. Uh, it was a five-piece band. I believe, and we, uh, the keyboard player, myself, and the drummer uh, ended up going down. Um, our bass player, uh, Cy Jack, who is an in- incredible bass player, but he uh, he had a job with the BBC, and he did the right thing and stayed, and uh, probably he's got his pension now. Well, I used to call people that wore suits. He turned into a suit man, right? Maybe I not. I can never see Cy as a suit man, okay. but uh, he, okay. he definitely was a very creative guy and he was in the right job. But yeah. uh, great bass player, but uh, you know he made the decision not to come down with us. So three of us, drummer, keyboard player, guitarist. And you decided that this is it. We're going to stay. We're going to stay. Oh, I loved the idea of London. It, it was, uh, you say I'm a romantic when it, when I thought of London. Yeah, I, I did the of, same. I did this the is same. Where you, yeah, yeah, it doesn't have that just, feel. Oh, just driving yeah. into London. It's, it's, it's an amazing feeling. I used to always have my amp in the back of the car and the bass. And you just would drive. As soon as you saw London appear off of the freeway, because I came from Southampton and Hampshire, and you leave all the trees behind, you just go, oh, my God, this is paradise. This is it. This is where it happens. Hammersmith Odeon, yeah. Marquee all the gigs that you dreamt about all the gigs that you look at in the newspaper i had the yeah. same feeling brian when i was getting into london and just being there i thought this is where it happens yes i've got to be here well i remember toting uh, our little demo tape around in those days it was a cassette tape right yeah oh yeah, yeah and um yeah. we would go to like directly to the gigs like uh, that we we had heard in scotland were the the best gigs to go to yeah yeah and it was like you know the um, the marquee like you were talking about the hope and anchor fulham palace road yeah, you know, the yeah, greyhound yeah yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and i used to go in there and we'd see like the jam stickers up on oh, the wall and yeah, think yeah. Oh, these guys are playing here yeah you know? marquee was like that wasn't yeah. it? every single and of course average white band must have been to a scottish band were they oh, around so. the same time or before you guys they were before us but um they were kind of my um, my best friends in Glasgow's older brothers band. That's they used to be complicated for musicians yes, to remember that. that. Yeah, yeah, it was a little bit tar- too hard for me to take. Just edit it out. <laughs> just, the hell. You know who we're playing to. You know who's listening to it. Don't get technical. I told you that. <laughs> <laughs> you know my audience. <laughs> but London was magical, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would never swap that experience for anything. It, it, um, it's really 
great to talk about this because it's bringing back to me what it was like to be in a bed sit and with the musicians and just you were going to struggle with five pounds in your pocket and uh, you were just going to fight on every day but you were in london i know it was a meager existence wasn't yeah. it yeah yeah yeah, well, yeah. You, you didn't have much food you didn't have much drink but uh but you had, you so had the hope. yeah so there's three friends there but you must have thought because i uh, we're, we're moving on here to when i actually met brian and brian came to an audition for a band called the charlie mullen band so you must have thought hey i have to do auditions besides my mates here i have to move on well we were we ended up in uh the the oberon band ended up getting a new singer a new bass player and uh excellent uh players but all we ended up doing is rehearsing I don't know if you remember Tom Robinson band. We used to, oh, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah the well, big hit, didn't they? We used time, to yeah. practice down south in the south of uh, London in, yeah. in the basement of Tom Robinson's wow. basement. Yeah, yeah. But that's where we lived. Yeah. You know, we, we didn't do any gigs. Yeah. And I was thinking, I want to play. I want to get out there. I want yeah. to yeah. do gigs. I want to be a, a musician and a songwriter. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the... Um, the ads in was it melody maker melody maker i put the ad in i was uh, i was with already in this band called the charlie mullen band and uh, charlie had trusted me to be sort of the uh, so-called music director and he said i want a new i want a whole brand new band uh, and when i joined that band there were other players so i decided to put a advert in the melody maker which which you did and if you if this ad had, was in a box and it said uh, about to sign record deal you would get a, lo a lot of response so well uh, charlie had the money i did the ad and um i met brian at the Charlie Mullen guitar auditions. And um, those auditions where we were also doing auditions for drummers. And there was about 30 drummers and there was about 50 guitarists. And uh, I was, I, in my mind, wanted to have two guitarists in the band because I was a fan of Thin Lizzy and I thought the dual guitars were very exciting. And I knew Charlie's music could take this, but that's where I met you first, Brian. You know, and when, when I first met you, all I could see was hair. <laughs> it and was a, walking hair with a guitar. Nose sticking out. Yeah, and there was, I think, a black Les Paul, right? It was a black Les Paul. Oh, the black sure Les Paul guitar. Nothing Still like got that. got it today. And uh, uh, probably Brian remembers more about that audition, and we're going to talk about that. But we're going to stop here for a second and play another brand new track that we wrote, and this one's called History. And I'll let Brian tell you, because Brian started this song. Started off with... Um you know, you'll hear in the intro uh, some chords, uh, ascending chords, and uh, then it goes into like a, a kind of verse. But there wasn't really that much to it, to be honest. Uh, played it to Martin. Martin says, that we've got something here. This, this is something I can work on. And he came in with a, with a, a melody and, and some vocals and really made it special and uh, some, some great lyrics. Uh, the, the name is History. Mm -hmm. and um, it is a very positive sounding song Could and what we're going to play you is, uh, is you're going to hear something that's really rough it's my guide vocals and just the backing track again it seemed to have we looked at each other so we got a bit of the flavor the old cue feel thing we going there but we are fair with the page so we're songwriters first but here we are we're going to play you something really rough brian started this one and it's called history Quest. 
history in today Well, that was great to hear that, because that's uh, a brand new song, actually. We're not finished. I mean, absolutely brand new, me doing guide vocals, but that's a track called History. We've, we're now going into the history of London, because that's when I met Brian. And uh, what was the audition like, Brian, when I met with you? What, what, can you remember any of that? I, uh, vividly. Wow! Oh, vividly. At your age? <laughs> yes, even at my age. <laughs> now, what, what happens is, in, in an audition situation, you're used to, like, maybe... Uh, two three guitarists or something yeah like that. maybe maybe right. even one i went for auditions where it was just me and two other guys that right was it. yeah this yeah. was a, this was a football crowd that's it? what i expected <laughs> what i got was i think there were 30 guitarists is that right mm. something like that it was i think it was more actually because um i'd had that ad out for quite a while but i do know that we had a waiting room and we had a couple of specialists sort of saying, number three, I come know. in now. And I know it was about 30, 30. We were all 30. twiddling our thumbs in the next room. Waiting yeah, and I suppose you, you, know, I, I, you must have heard some of the music going on in the room because it was me and Trevor and a keyboard player. And we were just running through, I think, three songs that we'd sent you to learn, right? Yes, yes. The, the ad said, I remember the ad said, uh, must be, it was like imperative, mandatory, you were into Steely Dan, Hall & Oates. Wow, I can't remember that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and something else, and I can't remember what the something else was, but um, it, it, it ticked all the boxes. That fascinates me. I can't remember how I put that ad in there. That's yeah. amazing. Amer oh, did you America. put the ad in? I wrote it all, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah I thought yeah. it was Charlie that put it in. No, no, Charlie yeah. sort of, um, uh, he was very, very trusting of me, and he just said, do you think we need some new players? And I had this vision that the band I was going to be in was going to be a mixture of Hall & Oates, Thin Lizzy meets Toto, meets something incredible from America. <laughs> But I did think that we needed two guitarists because I was a huge fan of Phil Linnott and I thought we needed to have that real sense of dual guitars. But I, if you can remember anything about that audition, because I can't, not too much. We, but we were well, on that, the, that is age. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thank you for that thank you you asked, you. you asked for that <laughs> we were on weren't we near the um thames we were right on the thames it you could was, see the you could see the river through yeah the, through the big window yeah. and kate bush had had been rehearsing there before is that right that's now right you, now you tell me I, something i can't remember yeah. it was a special room it was a great room it was uh you know it'd be very relaxing in another situation but you yeah. know Everybody wanted that gig because they were offering fifty pounds. Well, we had a bit over the 50 top. Fifty pounds a month or oh fifty pounds a week. I can't yeah. remember what it we was. We weren't cheap then. But anything over like a drink, yeah, in payment, yeah, was worth it. So That's fifty right. pounds was like what? Yeah, yeah. So I was determined I was going to get this gig. You now, know? You, now this is really great about auditions, and I'm sure a lot of you music, musicians out there know this feeling. You're sat in a room, right? I mean, I was uh, able to be the the, the the guy who's playing the music in the other room and, and seeing guitarists come in and just check them out but you have to be in a waiting room right you have to be in a waiting room and i was waiting with my my buddy ellis remember ellis i do drummer right? ellis mandelstam yeah and he came for the audition for drums yeah. and i came for the audition for guitar ah. so uh we both listened to the 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 cassette tape you know that was sent to us and uh I, I just did you practice much i wore that thing out you know <laughs> i was determined i was going to get this gig of course you have no control over it you walk yeah. in there and it's like yeah. you play your best and yeah. you hope for the best you know yeah. I, can, I i have to say here though all those guitarists <laughs> came through and um the drummer that was rehearsed uh, became the drummer Trev. uh, trevor thornton who became the q field drummer and he was so so young that we were he was he sat down every time somebody else came in to play the drums he was very we were using his drum kit not him um but we didn't want a young guy in the band but trevor did end up being the guy but i remember when trevor uh, when brian came in and played i instantly knew that we had a very very special guitarist on our hands who had such a understanding of american rock and i mean that's quite strange but i think sometimes you think of scottish musicians sometimes had a great affinity to what came from america yeah that um well believe it or not there's um a lot of american influence in uh, like country music yeah uh, or or the other way around like you know scott's influence in uh, american country music as well like bluegrass and uh, you know the appalachian mountains yeah yeah that's where a lot of scott settled yeah um you went to an even colder place oh no colder place <laughs> 
I always remember Billy Connolly saying, when the Scots left Scotland, they went to the Appalachian Mountains. It's absolutely <laughs> obvious right. they would go there. <laughs> Sucked in, naturally. <laughs> it feels like home! <laughs> they got the, the, the weirdest people went to the Appalachians, <laughs> as we all know. Now, jumping on here, because we, 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 we're moving through everything, actually, uh, Brian got chosen. Uh, I knew on the day that Brian was a guitarist, another guitarist called Dick Scarf, and I thought I had the two really most brilliant guitarists I could get in London, and I still believe that. Now, we we were in, uh, Brian had just joined then a band called the Charlie Mullen Band. I spoke on episode four with Trevor Thornton about this Charlie Mullen. He was an incredibly strange and wonderful character in many ways, but I wanted to see what uh, Brian thought about being in the Charlie Mullen Band. Of course, when we finished the auditions, we went back to a big house in Hampstead where we all sat around with wine and big rooms and uh, uh, groupies. Everything was nice and just felt like a real rock band. But what did it feel like to you when we got chosen for Charlie Mullen Band? It was unreal. I, I thought I'd hit the big time. I thought this is it. For a very short time, right? For a very short time. <laughs> now, we we went into 14 days, was it, of like intense rehearsal. Oh, it you, was I like, can't remember that. Uh, yeah, yeah, we had like about 12 songs and we had to learn 12 songs perfectly. Yeah. Um, you know, in fact, there was some minor choreography there with the guitarist walking forward That's to the stage. Right. Remember all that? I, I yeah. do now. Yeah, because it was that yeah. thin Lizzy thing. Yeah. And we had the uh, the confetti bombs on stage. Oh, we had a lot of money uh, somehow. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we had backing, right? That's right. And yeah. we did. We, we after those rehearsals, then Brian, we went and played. As Trevor said, I think some of the biggest London gigs very quite quickly, didn't we? Yeah, we played music the music machine, the venue. The venue was huge. Yeah, that yeah. that was. Uh, I think they had every uh, record uh, company executive yeah. available in London. Char Charlie seemed to have this way. He had contacts. He yeah. had contacts, and um, uh, making the, the long story quite short, he was very, very. Um, uh, pronounced and being a bit of a con man and being a businessman at the same time uh, fantastic we thought we were going to be in one of the biggest bands in london for that time so when we played mm. these london gigs everybody that was anybody from record labels was sat there weren't they yes and we thought this is it you know we're like a nine piece nine or twelve or fourteen or fifteen huge piece band. band huge band huge yeah. i think we had two drummers didn't we? we had one percussionist and a one drummer, percussionist that yeah. that's right and we had uh, three girl singers yeah sax uh, player we had mel mel collins mel collins yeah from yeah. kokomo and yeah. um top session player uh, who was with us i think that was star power brought in yeah. and we had a keyboard player called dave fischel who dave came fischel. god mate yeah. i'm remembering all this and it was uh, he was from liverpool and came we from liverpool and i think we of you and another guitarist myself on bass and charlie and we did these six good gigs and i think they were quite well received gigs i mean we were we were playing quite well at that time i gotta tell everybody that's listening that because this is radio and you don't have a visual mm. this is the first time i saw a bass player jump off of the stage and walk through the the audience with a plug dent this was before <laughs> radio mics and radio uh, uh leads play with a plugged in bass oh my god in the audience oh my god you used to whip them up i'd never seen anything like that you were ah. you were a force yeah well i was i you know record with you uh, <laughs> I, I i think when i played these gigs i'd look at the stage and go can i actually get down there and, and you then, did and then get back up again uh, and uh, that was the hard part yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'm down here. I'm down here. You play the rest of the gigs on the floor with the, the audience. <laughs> they don't seem to need me back up there. Where's Martin gone? <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, Charlie, you know, he was, he was quite into it. He said, go and do do your thing, you know. And um, one one thing we must bring up here is we were one of these bands that were amateurish, but amateur, but we had all the pyrotechnics. Yes. We had, um, you know, as Brian said, confetti bombs and explosions at certain... I mean, it was pretty amazing we had all this going on at the same time. But I do remember we did one gig and Charlie didn't have the greatest eyesight. And um, he used to, he was actually very short-sighted. And when the when the stage was dark and uh, couldn't see much, he would walk across all the uh, guitarist pedals, right? That's right. So Brian would go, oh, get away, get He'd away. He'd unplug them all. <laughs> <laughs> as he walked across the stage <laughs> so we were, we were sort of on the defensive as our songwriter our singer went wandering around and once because i knew he couldn't see so well you know and he turned around to me and go what song are we going to sing next what is it because we had a, we had it written down and i mentioned it to him but what charlie didn't also realize that there were pyrotechnics very near where he bent down to read what song he had to <laughs> and we had a guy who was i should say the word pissed he was very drunk who had to push the button at the right time when the certain song happened and uh, he was supposed to be rehearsed but as charlie bent down in the darkness to to look at what song he had to play next the man pushed the pyrotechnics <laughs> pushed the button. Right, right in his face <laughs> Boom. 
And all I saw was hair being blown back. <laughs> Are you sure that wasn't me? Because that happened to me too. Oh, well, you were probably in that in yeah. that same explosion. Music Man. It was a That's Music right. Man uh, That's right. gig. And there was a Scotland-England game on. Yeah, and uh, we had all the fans in there. Huge crowd. And uh, you and came was, on. Elvis and Costello was in the crowd. That's well. right. He Elvis was. Costello he was. was. There. He was there to see the explosion <laughs> of a songwriter. That's well, right. the singer blew up. Yes. I've never seen a man exploded before on stage. <laughs> it was fascinating. And... <laughs> <laughs> and the crowd cheered. <laughs> My hair was on fire. You, you were, you were, you. Were, it was very dangerous actually, because I think it you was. were thinking about fire as well. Because I mean, I just remember seeing Charlie, just like in the Poltergeist movie, where just all this white light went past <laughs> this man's head. And the thing was, after I thought that's pretty impressive. We should do that every night. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> thought it was part of the act. Yeah. No. So, as you can gather here, the Charlie Mullen band was short-lived, but it was very, very exciting. And then, in the, and then the big, big picture, I met with Brian, and instantly we became friends, didn't we? Absolutely, yeah. There was uh, something, something really clicked. It yeah. was, uh, it was funny because the, the band was all about Charlie Mullen, but for me, it was more about who ran the band, and that was you. Yeah, yeah I, you know, it's a funny thing, bro. I don't think I was running the band, but Charlie was becoming more and more um, strange, wasn't he? Yes. You know, I mean, we, we had, this is another story that we had that at the end of the six gigs, because Charlie wasn't the most friendly to some people, we had a roadie come up to both me and Brian and say, I know he's, we don't like him and you don't like him. Do you want us to knife him? <laughs> Uh, which and he actually did say that he yeah. actually did say I got we a, could take care of him yeah got, got a knife on me and if you want it to happen Martin and Brian we love, word. we love you and you won't even know anything about it I mean <laughs> <laughs> that's how the 70s were but they were like pirates these guys weren't yeah, they and we, yeah they were like pirates I mean really they were like the road crew that had been touring with Jethro Tull for 50 years I mean it was like bandanas they, and missing teeth yes <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> knife, knife in the mouth. We finished off a lot of other singers like him. It's not a problem. <laughs> uh, but we both, Brian and I, said, I think it was at the Marquee we did that. We said, no, Marquee. Let, let him live. Yeah. Let him Wardour live. Street. That's there we right. go. Yeah. <laughs> Death on Wardour Street <laughs> would have been too good. Um, we're going to go straight into another song that we've written together, um, and this is a song called The Soul Engineers. We're having fun with this. It's a rough mix we're going to play you. Not finished, but again, I think Bry has a bit of that q feel vibe. It's got a little magic. Yeah. So here it is, a roughie. The Soul Engineers.
There we go, the Soul Engineers playing you some real, 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 real roughs here and some stuff from the archives that um, really quite exciting for me and Bride to play you because we haven't finished this stuff but we're having fun working on them. Now we're getting back to the Charlie Mulling experience of the 70s. That actually, when the Charlie Mulling band broke up, right, Bri, we became songwriters together. That's right. That and was, that was the beginning of that. That was the birth of uh, Fair Weather Page. Because um, um, I think the backers of Charlie believed in you and me and they said, well, well, we'll stop backing Charlie. We'll give you £30 each. And uh, we had this Jewish consortium that was actually helping us develop to be songwriters. So we got a little four track. We went into my flat in Islington. And at that point, if I'm right, Brian, I, and I am old, so you might have to help me with this. Didn't we at that point say we have to put everything into being songwriters? Yes. Uh, at that point, it was more about being backroom boys and getting the, the material. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and you know, it's, I used to always think, I don't know if you did when you're in, uh, in your bands, I used to think however good the band looks, however well we play, it's always going to come down ultimately the song. to the song. Absolutely, yeah. And, and we actually uh, sat in that little uh, Islington flat and we um, wrote songs at that point and that was the beginning, I suppose, of our career with Zomba and uh, I suppose the beginning of Q Field. Can you remember anything about that period in my flat? I know you used to bring up a Fender amplifier up the staircase. Well, I used to get it down from... I used to live in Muswell Hill. Those who live in London know that's in the north of London. Uh, Where all about, guitarists live. What right right? about N10, I think it is? London yeah. N10. I used to get a bus from Muswell Hill down to Islington, Nine Ockenden Road, where Martin lived. That's it. That's the place. And I used to put my twin, Fender Twin Reverb amp oh. combo in... Where, you know, remember the old luggage things that, under the... Those amps are so heavy. Yes. So, so I used to put that under there, my, my guitar under there, and I used to go upstairs for a smoke. Ah, and okay. then I'd get close to the and run downstairs and sort of like run up Nobody's the Nobody's stolen your amp, right? Nobody stole the amp. I didn't, <laughs> didn't even think about it in those days, you know? Crazy. Youth. Crazy youth. I, I can still think that we had three floors to go up. Um, on the, and I lived at the top flat of Nine Ockenden Road, very high in Islington. How Brian trudged that amp. And in those days, we were so enthusiastic that I'd say, do you want to leave your amp here overnight? And Brian would go, no, I'm taking it home because I might Got write practice. I might write something on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> on the bus. <laughs> That's how I'm dedicated. Plug me in, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I can't sleep without my amplifier right next to me, <laughs> lad. Um, now, that led us on at that period. Um when we were writing on a four track to actually join uh, to a label. We, we took our songs, I think. We made cassettes, as we said before, this re retro show, and we made these demos, which I think were right across, not even Q-Field demos. They were right across the spectrum because we liked American music very strongly, didn't we? Yes. So we, we were very influenced by bands like Hall and & Oates and Toto and Boss Gags. We really felt that that was uh, musicianship we could aspire to, didn't we? Yes. Now, um we we used to sit for hours listening to uh, to American music, uh, Earth, Wind and Fire, yeah. uh, Brothers Johnson. Yeah. I remember you're a big Brothers oh. Johnson fan because yeah. of the bass. But yeah, uh, yeah I mean that's uh, I could see that in your performance and your playing yeah. with the slap and pull, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Great turn on, that was that was a magical time. I mean, it was education for us, you know, because yeah. we were just like soaking everything up. Yeah. Um, we discovered Prince around about that time, remember? I do, Brian. Yeah. I do. Yeah. And this was, you know, somebody like Prince was phenomenal yeah. in, the, in those days that played every single instrument. And at that same time, we would also be influenced by something like the fusion jazz bands that were happening then. There was Stanley Clark and the Romantic Warrior album and Chick Corea. I know that around the edges, we would actually learn those albums, yes. wouldn't we? Just to, yes. so that we were, we were fascinated with American recording and how you could get great sonics. And um, something about America always made us feel like we need to aspire to that um, great recording ethic, didn't we, a musicianship? Well, when you heard something American, if it was quality American, which a lot of it was that we were listening to, we felt obliged. I mean, it, it was like your duty to learn how to play it. Absolutely. It was yeah. like, we need to be this good. You know, yes. there's, there's no way, no second best in this, in this game. Absolutely. You had to be the best. And we used to, and in those days, um, I wonder if any of you out there can relate to this, and I'm sure you can, but we bought the albums and we studied all the players that played on these records because everybody would be credited so brian would say look it's steve lukather playing on this session and i'd say oh look it's willie weeks playing bass on this and it was really something we aspired to to be session players and their names being credited which you don't see these days right no that's right that was, that was a big part of listening to an album was reading the uh, the, the notes yeah. reading the sleeve you know we'd li we'd listen to uh, yeah. the album 
at the same time reading where it was recorded, Magical. who produced it, yeah. who was the engineer, yeah. who were the musicians, who wrote what. It I, I got to so ju- I got to jump in here that we're saying it at this point because really ultimately we did end up in los angeles working with these people that we'd studied on paper we were we did end up in the studios with earth wind and fire we did end up with uh, toto players we did end up with um abe laborio and john robinson on drums i mean we 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 knew so much about them before we uh, even came to LA and to be in the rooms with them was pretty stunning wasn't it it was a uh, dream come true yeah. I remember we went to uh, courtesy of Diane Poncher our, our mutual manager at yep. the time uh, we got to go to uh, a Earth Wind and Fire concert at Wembley remember that that's in the early days of Q-Phil yeah back in yep. England yeah and that was the first time I'd seen Earth Wind and Fire blown away by yeah. the performance i mean everything was choreographed down to a second down to a step yeah and we um who got the, got our tickets from diane we went to wembley very early got there before anybody else did and we sat in the front nearly the front row and we watched earth wind and fire come out brian me and trevor and we watched them w- work around the piano and get their songs together and we both were looking at each other saying that's what a pro band does before they even play they're working out their arrangements before they play they're still thinking about the music lo and behold um we didn't know earth wind and fire but, but at that time but about two months later we were actually working with them which is a phenomenal they're in the, they're in the sound studio with them yeah, yeah. and I, you know they, they had nothing against scotsman which i was quite surprised about i was very pleased about that <laughs> <coughs> you changed your accent didn't you <laughs> scottish me no. no no not me hey we're going to jump straight back here because we're moving on at quite a speed here but when me and brian decided to be uh, songwriters we had this thing that we said there's lennon and mccartney there's bugatti and musker there's holland dozier holland there's these teams and we loved that and I, we both loved that on record labels in brackets were the these names that you saw you thought those are the real real masters of why this record happened so we made this pact didn't we bright um fair with the page and i fair thought why page. isn't it page fair with but fair with the page sounded better <laughs> it did sound better it looked better on the back of the jackets we made as well remember <laughs> oh my god oh no i don't know hey, embarrassing as it is no no we no, made we, jackets we made we had these american baseball jackets because we were very influenced by america and we put fair with the page cut out didn't we and your girlfriend put our name on the back of that's our, right yeah. it was, and it looked great it was sewn on and embossed in the back of the jacket and we wore them with great great honor and oh, we were uh, so proud of those jackets we turn up to record companies wearing it and they're like oh these guys are really serious or they're idiots or whatever they had no idea what to make of us we turned up in a base baseball jackets or it was, it was like a college jacket it was right college jacket american there's a, college there's a jacket. name from i can't remember what it is it's like a letter jacket or something like that yeah yeah i keep on and, saying uh, baseball jackets but and it was like uh <laughs> we had a white white shirt and a tie on blue like a school yeah. tie well, we, but this is another another uh, story that I, I actually forgotten, but our manager, Diane, at that time told me about, that um, we used to turn up uh, at appointments wearing English ties, and maybe we'd be carrying briefcases full of cassette songs. <laughs> used to frighten a lot of people. Oh. <laughs> well, we can, you know, uh, I won't go too fast here, but as you can tell, back in London at that time when Brian and I said we're going to be songwriters, we took it very serious, and um, we made, uh, even our cassettes were printed up with Fair Weather Page very professionally, mm-hmm. had our telephone number on it, didn't it yes, right. had the address that is where creativity came we gave about. everything up <laughs> <laughs> what size of underpants we wore <laughs> which didn't help us at all none of that helped us but out of this songwriting period um we actually went to a publisher called um zomba and they were a new publishing company in london and uh, i turned up at the at the door um well, why were we going for publishing deals i'd never known we, we just said it's the right thing to do we could have gone for a recording contract but we didn't really know what we were doing did we no not at that time we were we were sort of like admired in songwriting so mm. you know we were looking at um, like you were saying all the uh, you know the the uh, the partnerships that yes. seemed to be published they were published yeah and we were learning at that time what publishing and recording means you know yeah you get publishing royalties you get you get mechanical royalties from recording you get publishing and royalties from writing you know yeah yeah so we were learning the difference and we thought this was the right thing to do at the time and i turned up at all these appointments you know uh, and brian did as well we sort of we, one time i would go then brian would go then we go together we went to chrysalis records and uh, chrysalis publishing and they showed some interest in us we went to um i believe djm and they hated my our songs <laughs> <laughs> and they sent me a letter, which I've still got, that said, you. Oh, you it, really, it really, uh-huh. and I framed it, and it really did say, you know, uh, you guys are lovely, but you really should think about doing something like manual labor. Don't give up your day job. It was like that. It was there. I thought, I thought, 
I don't like that at all. I won't say a bad word, but I was like, no, no, I'm going to fight past that. Now, this was Elton John's company, so I was very hurt by that. Then we tur- I turned up at a company I didn't know called Zomba, and I turned up at 7 a.m. in the morning. And little did I know that the man who made me turn up at 7 a.m. in the morning, which was Ralph Simon at this company, he said, I'm more impressed that you turned up at, On seven, time. <laughs> yeah. at 7. No musician yeah. turns up at 7. And, make a long story short, he liked a song called Doctor on the Radio. Mm-hmm. Um, and he heard um, uh, Brian and my demos past that point, and he said, I want to, which is quite surprising, he said, you, you should um, make a record, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Which we were surprised about. Yeah, um, we hadn't really thought about like uh, making a record. We just wanted to be the, uh, you know, the Motown gang. You yeah, know, yeah. we wanted to be in there, being songwriters, right for other yeah. people. But you know, when we, the more we thought about it, when we went away from it, the more it made sense. It's like it was a, it was a vehicle for our our songs, and it made sense to Zomba as well because you know it's a publishing company's uh, uh, gig to get songs covered. So if you've got a a, a ready made band there covering their own songs you've got some covers absolutely and uh, you know he must have heard something in our demo actually the demo of uh doctor and radio um maybe i'll be able to find that and play it um i've got a copy of it somewhere. do you um yeah. okay well so maybe that's what we'll, we'll be playing on this show or not this show or the next show but that's pretty amazing we still have the demo of it which is pretty phenomenal um but i know that um we signed the deal and we made a record and doctor and the radio it was more reggae, wasn't it? Scar. Scar. Yeah. Scar. And that was the thing that was happening then. And we thought, that's that's vibey. You had... Um, Selector. Selector. There yeah. you go. The beat. The beat. Yeah. yeah. So we went that way. The record sold five copies in France. Nowhere else. Um, five copies. Yeah, and I stayed up all night to hear it on Radio <laughs> sure 1. sure five? <laughs> <laughs> five sounds a bit good, doesn't it? Three. Five sounds good. Three. Yeah, I made that up, actually. But I don't think it sold any at all. But um, <laughs> I stayed up. I think both of us stayed up to like 2.30 in the morning because they said on Radio 4, they're going to spin Doctor the Radio. Wow. And I heard, it on, I heard it on the radio and I was so thrilled. Anyway, um, before we even get to that single, I've just got to drop back a little bit because this is going to be fun to ask Brian. Our publisher said, you need to work with some people. And uh, they sent us to work with Reckless Eric. Ah, Punk artist of the time. Now, here's Fair with the Page, American, uh, smooth, rocky, uh, sophisticated, and they're throwing us at Reckless Eric. Um, but we thought that's pretty good. We, we thought we could make it work, didn't we? We, uh, we thought we could make it work, and we actually did make it work. I mean, we actually we got to the point where he, uh, I think Eric, it was hard to tell, he actually accepted the way we looked, the way we acted, and the way we wrote. Because when we first met him... We I got think, on well, didn't we? We got really... I think he was yeah. one of the first guys that we scared off with the, the briefcases. Well, I remember this. We, we were went, told not to do it. Really. We went into Stiff Records, and because he was signed to Stiff Records, and we turned up with our Fair Weather Page jackets mm-hmm. on, world-famous jackets, and then we had briefcases, and uh, the head of Stiff Records... And this is actually written in the biography of Stiff Records about us doing that, turning up a briefcase. It really? It's in there. Wow. The story of Stiff. That they said to us, you know, you'd be doing yourself a favor if reckless eric doesn't see that you've got briefcases <laughs> <laughs> i had everything in my briefcase <laughs> my whole <laughs> life was in my briefcase. <laughs> we were professionals <laughs> and uh, he said you know the more you can be loose and round the edges rough and uh, that you have to be that way you can't be businessmen because they were struggling with reckless eric mm-hmm. he could they he couldn't have a hit um if they bought it so we were a last ditch effort and they did say that um, you know Reckless was coming through some drinking problems and whatever. But if you if you can if you can write six or seven songs together, we'd be very interested to hear it. We got on with Reckless, I think, pretty well. I think he took to us. No, it, we were so different. I think we yeah. we kind of looked at each other. We'd say something to each other, and then like look at each other, and there'd be a awkward silence. And it was like we we're just sussing each other out, and then he'd go. <laughs> <laughs> And he wore dark glasses, so we couldn't really tell what oh, he was feeling. That's right, he always yeah. wore dark, dark glasses. It was like really <laughs> difficult to tell what he was thinking. But we did, we did these demos at my, my flat. And um, I must say here, Brian, you really, the music was all you on guitar with him. I can't remember. But did you actually, um, how did we write those songs? Did we start them or did Reckless start them? Well, he would, uh, generally speaking, he would come up with a, a lyrical idea. And, uh, Jesus Saves? Jesus Don't Saves! <laughs> And that was it. That was enough to start us off. Yeah, oh, okay, you I got pretty I got boys. Keep saying that. Yeah, Keep yeah. saying that. I'll, I'll build on it. You know. Is that how he worked with him? Yeah, I mean, he would have like uh, he'd have him. He used to play very basic guitar, so he would like uh, strum away. And, and he didn't would he have a? I might be crazy here. But didn't he uh-huh. have a yellow uh, 
Les Paul Jr.? Yes, he did. Oh, yes. good. I've still got well, my brain. Well remembered. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Well, he used to th thrash away on the guitar, and he used to do a little cassette, like we all did in, in those days. We used to do our uh, initial demos on, uh, on live cassette, and uh, that's what we got to write on. And those demos I still have here, and they're, pr you know, they're great demos and great songs. And we got very near to making the record. Um, the record company loved the songs. Um, I still think they're really quite powerful. And it's surprising. Reckless was quite an interesting singer, wasn't he? When we first mm -hmm. heard him, we were like, oh, dear, oh, dear. And then when you listen back, he had real character. Mm -hmm. And we went to the major studios to do the record, and he threw a wobbler and didn't turn up. I think he stood outside for a while and thought, I don't want anything to do with this. It's too too classy. And he did a he, runner, didn't he? He headed for the pub, I think. He headed for the pub. Yep. And that led me to actually talking to the person who read, who was running the studio. A lady was there and she knew. I said, I want to get to Los Angeles and me and Brian should go to Los Angeles and we should write songs in America. That's what we should do. And she put us in touch with uh, Diane Poncher in LA um, that uh, really started our career in Los Angeles. But I want to just say here... Um, before, I think, is it before Reckless Eric or after Reckless Eric, we were enticed into doing, as q -Phil, our band, the Euro Eurovision Song Contest. That's right. Yeah. Um, why did we do that, Brian? Um, we were convinced very heavily by the record company who said, this is going to be your big break. This is very difficult to break two unknown guys uh, in yep. Britain. And, yeah, we couldn't argue with them because we tried with Doctor on the radio and it didn't hit. Yeah. So um, I, didn't we also release... Uh, dancing in heaven well this is it yeah dancing in heaven was the we do uh, if you think about this quite funny here that our first single was scar reggae mm -hmm. our second single was like ultravox i mean we, we went a real 45 degree angle from because we were it being turned on by what was happening in the charts we suddenly became a synthesizer band and were very interested with technology right. now for all, we thought it was a strong record for all around the world it was bubbling in america but england not but somehow eurovision song contest i think they thought we need something modern and new and fresh and they we got into the top six songs of eurovision song contest and all we could think about was if we win this thing we're going to end up in the double decker bus at the top <laughs> an open open top double decker bus waving <laughs> british flags going hey everybody see you in blackpool i'm so sorry we won <laughs> 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 I remember that when the record company said to me and Brian, you should do Eurovision, we said, no bloody way, no <laughs> way. And, he, and, they, and this guy, Stephen Howard, who um, was saying, no, he's a good opportunity. And I said, I'll only do it if me and Brian can make the band look like the Tubes. Yes. We'd seen the Tubes in America with the two sexy girls and they were just wild, wild. And I thought, if we're going to do Dancing in Heaven live, we're going to be wild in left field. And they somehow agreed to it. Um, the only thing they didn't agree to is we had a drummer. Um, what was his name? Um, uh, Trevor. Not, not Trevor, the other drummer that came in to do that because he Roy. could sing. Roy. Roy Ward. Roy Ward could sing. So we had to have somebody, because it was a live performance, yes. live performance. So we had to have this drummer who played with City Boy to, be, uh, to play with us. That's right. That's right. And uh, before we went on stage... We all, I was into even meditating. I said, let's get together, lads, and all just stand around. And our Steve Howard from the record company came in, and he saw how we were dressed. And we were dressed military and strange, like the tubes, very bizarre. I got a lot of the stuff from my father from um, NASA. And so we, as you'll see from the video, which I don't know, I'm still upset that it got out. But it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's you, you can see us there. And um, very, very high tech and all that stuff. And I'm sucking into an air aircraft. Uh, mask pretending yeah. that I'm sucking in drugs and everything and of course the BBC let me do that without even really knowing but before we went on stage the record company came in and they looked at our drummer and our drummer had ear an earring and they were like take that out take that earring out and he was like no no <laughs> and also he had a short sleeve shirt on and he had such an incredible amount of hair on his arms didn't There's he Remember? more hair on his arms than I've got in my head right now <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, and he was so adamant. He goes, he "No, a, he had a parting on his arm. <laughs> he had a couple, party. couple of combs in his pocket to work <laughs> on it." <laughs> Lovely man, love Roy. And I mean, he just had this fur on his arms. And the, and our, our guy Stephen Howard was saying, "You can't go on to TV with fur on your <laughs> arms." <laughs> with fur on <laughs> and he was fighting with him and it was getting real aggressive oh, right. and luckily you know uh, which i i would say that roy won the battle and he went on yes, with it so if you look at the demo you should just stare for those uh, for that moving furry hair you'll see it on our drummer's arm well, there's also one second where uh, just after the uh, the drum break digga 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 yeah. yeah, right. right and he he turns his head roy turns his head and his headphones fly off <laughs> And nobody's noticed that, I think, until uh, somebody pointed it out to me. He said, did your 
Drummer loses I, I see that every time now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah we had a keyboard obviously. player called Chris Richardson who was a great, great, he was excellent, great yeah. player, great, great musician. Um, but none of us really knew what we were doing on that show, and that was the Q Phil days. So, um, well, the beginning of Q Phil. Going to play you now a brand new song again, um, a brilliant piece which Brian's been working on, and um, I think I'm saying the title right here because he brought it to me, and I'm sort of playing around with it and adding to it. It's called Amritsar, right? That's right. And there's a story behind this, which I think you should tell, Bright. It's pretty amazing. Well, real quick, without getting into it too heavily, um, in Amritsar, in uh, the Punjab, in 1919, there was a um, a, a meeting of, um, of Punjabis in a park, and it had been announced by the British government, who were the uh, the... The, uh, in charge at the time that uh, there would be no uh, collective meetings and uh, you know th this was strictly against the law ended up in a massacre and uh, over a thousand people got killed by the British army uh, who just kept firing until they ran out of ammunition it was a terrible thing Amritsar was the town that it would that it happened in mm -hmm. and um, this is in commemoration of uh, that event which is just over a hundred years now no more to be said, here is uh, the early demo of Amritsar. challenge for me because Brian was asking me to sing some of these chants with him which uh, you know it's, it's an interesting track uh, uh, time-wise I he took he had to I had to practice very hard to sing with him but what what is what does that chant um, actually mean Brian 
Um, it it was a Punjabi chant, and I'm pr- forgive me if there's any Punjabis out there that say that is not what it means, but this is what I got from it. It it was na nazir, na dalil, na vakir, na appeal, which was basically. Um, you know, there was no inquest into the uh, the tragedy, into the massacre, Amritsar, and uh, there was no satisfactory resolution to it, and it it still lies open. There was no apology, basically, for uh, for, for the, the devastating event that happened. That's about it. Yeah, well, that's it's brilliant to work on that track because um, Brian brought that to me, and it was a it's becoming a beautiful challenge, and we're still only really halfway through that. I'm very interested to see how we finish that. The big news is me and Brian are writing songs together. It's fantastic that after all these years, we still are being fair with the page. It's a wonderful thing. It's a real luxury, and we don't take it for granted. It's just beautiful to have my best friend with me here in my house, like we used to do years and years ago. I think we're very lucky to be writing music, and. Uh, I just want to thank Brian for being here. Right there with you, mate. God bless you. All right, matey boy. And uh, I hope to see you again pretty soon because we've got a lot of mu- music to finish. Absolutely. And that was the end of part one with Brian. We went talking for days and months and years. So there's going to be a Brian Fairweather special part two. So uh, keep your eyes and your ears clued to Radio Owl's Nest uh, for part two with Brian, which is actually much, much, much better than part one. And how can that happen? Hard to believe. Just want to say to all you owl heads out there, thank you for joining me and Brian. Look after yourselves, look after the animals, and I'll be seeing you real soon in the owl's nest. Bye-bye.